Hello everyone, this is Kester Optorial, and as promised, this is my discussion video of Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, chapters 2 through 4. When I first read these chapters, the term geonesy was a new one to me. The natural positions of minerals, in particular rocks, together with the grouping of those rocks, their geographical distribution, and various relations. It does look like that term is still in use, albeit rarely to this day. I hadn't come across it before this book. For the first few pages, the chapter talks about the life and studies of Abraham Gautlud Warner, a German geologist who was born on September 25th, 1749, and lived until June 30th, 1817. Now, he was known for two things in his career, one being a strange idea of rock formation that proposed that rocks formed from the crystallization of minerals in the early oceans, an idea that came to be known as Neptunism. We now know that rocks are made from three distinct processes. The cooling of magma, which produces various igneous rocks. The compaction of sand and soils, these are sedimentary rocks, and from a process in which Either of those are altered by intense heat and pressure deep underground, which transforms them into metamorphic rocks. Sound familiar? We've all heard of those before. Well, most of us, they're pretty basic uh, geology. Back in the 1700s, though, rock formation was still a branch of geology that was full of many different competing ideas. Plate tectonics, which came to answer a huge number of questions about geology um, and the natural world, would not be well described and understood until the 1900s. The other thing that Werner was uh, known for, as mentioned in the beginning of this chapter, the application of geology, particularly the distribution of minerals in rocks and rock layer stratigraphy, to the profession of mining. As the chapter says, when he showed that he was able to apply the study of mineral position and the position of stratigraphic layers, though I'm not sure when they came to be called stratigraphic layers, uh, but you get the picture, to mining, which was and is a highly profitable trade, suddenly people had widespread reason uh, to take an interest in the science of geology because it could improve skill and efficient, efficiency in a profession that was still quite dangerous, and uh, it is to this day, but back then was considerably more so. It's pointed out in these first couple of pages in the chapter or chapters that the observations made by the scientists who in Werner's time were still mostly the very wealthy or the children of the wealthy who had time and money to fund expeditions around the world and take their time making notes and observations and publishing studies. When Werner tried to associate the minerals in rocks and strata to the movement of people and populations throughout history and the varying technologies that civilizations were able to achieve, and this was more him being a complete geology nerd and purist thinking geology had the answers to um, the disparity in uh, innovation and technology between civilizations, uh, from civilization to civilization. Uh, there's a tiny amount of realism there. Certainly there is different quality rock in different parts of the world. But the differences in technology have quite a lot more to do with varying developments in ideas and mathematical and engineering skills among populations in history. And that is very strongly tied with which societies arose that were more free and more meritocracy because you need a comp competition and a thirst for new ideas in order for those ideas to come about and be fully manifested. Uh, 
has a lot more to do with that than with what raw materials were available. I mean, we found numerous ways to improve upon materials. Higher quality metals were invented by a process of combination, uh, purifications, innovation rather than what each civilization had which quarries to work with. Again, there's a little bit there, maybe a little bit to do with the rate of invention, but not nearly as much as Werner liked to imagine. In the following pages, uh, the, the guy was described as being rather arrogant, believing that his own developed ideas took precedence in the field, and that the nucleus of the rock strata uh, found around the world was those of his own surroundings. Provided, of course, that Charles Lyell was writing in this book an accurate account of what Abraham Warner was like. They did overlap in their lifespans. Uh, Lyle was 40 years younger. If he was ever Werner's student, I'd be pretty confident in definitely trusting his account of Werner, since we've all known teachers and professors who consider themselves to be the most important voice in their fields. Uh, their class is the most important class, so you really got to focus on their homework, their homework. <laughs> I've certainly known a few like that. In fact, about halfway through college, I had this chemistry professor who thought exactly this, that he was the most important teacher of his department. But he wasn't a good explainer at all. He would just read from the book and assign complicated problems, but would never answer any student's questions. He would always say, just go and look it up in the book. When we were usually asking him, because the textbook was very unclear. I did manage to pass that course, but only because my dad, who himself was a professor some time ago, uh, helped me through the coursework. I would often, uh, when I was in college at this time, uh, this was 10, 8, 10 years ago, something like that. Um, I would often commute after my classes to visit his office and my dad's office, and he would help me with my chemistry work. Uh, he had been a physics professor focusing on electrical engineering and optics, but he knew enough to help me with chemistry. And this professor, th there, there's no way I would have passed the class without my dad's help. When he was a professor himself, he actually wanted to focus on continuously improving the teaching for the students. Uh, the university actually told him he was dead weight because he wasn't pulling enough grant money in for them. What does that tell you? It tells you that they care more about gobbling up government money than actually providing quality education. And I mean, the, the state of university education now is worse than high school education, which has a lot of the same basic failings, but college is worse, not better. So, but go going back to uh, Werner, his ideas about minerals having formed from chemical precipitates in the water. It's been so long since Werner and Lyle's time that many geologists living now aren't aware that that was once a dominant hypothesis. In chemistry, precipitate in is, is a term given to a solid that collects usually at the bottom of a solution. It's often what you're trying to either make or observe in experiments. The idea that all of the rocks and minerals found on rocky planets like Earth came from precipitates from chemical solutions in the early ocean or whatever fluid uh, they believe the infant planet was made of. And several times referred to it as a chaotic fluid. Uh, I guess what God had to start with. And... I mean, I, I can certainly see how that would manifest as an early idea before the nature of accretion and planet formation was understood. It does sound like a real possible origin. 
as we now know, the Earth was molten rock to begin with. The water had to form on the Earth. The oceans had to form from uh, two main sources. Uh, volcanic gases that precipitated water, or rained precipitation, uh, and also from water, ice, and asteroids and comets that crashed into the Earth, adding their water to what the Earth already had. Mostly during the late heavy bombardment that took place around 4 billion years ago. Uh, solar system, planet, uh, planet migration, the late heavy bombardment. A fascinating story. Uh, there's several documentaries talk about it. I am looking for my place in the script. Yes, I had to write this all down. This is quite the lengthy discussion because it was quite a lengthy three chapters merged into one. I still don't understand why they, why uh, Lyle didn't, or, or, or this version of the book, uh, didn't publish uh, chapter separations would have helped. So then we talk about a French geologist named Nicolas de Marst, who spent years surveying and taking measurements of the geology and topography of Avignon, France, which in the late 1700s was its own named region in France. It's now a part of a region named uh, Avignon Rhone Alps. Uh, he constructed, looking, uh, surveying the landscape, the topography is the different elevations and uh, the different layouts, the streams and rivers, the hills. He constructed what was at the time the most detailed and comprehensive geologic map of the region. He was one of the first geologists to understand that basalt rock layers were in fact ancient lava streams. The third major character of the time that these chapters introduce is James Hutton, who, like many of the explorer scientists of the time, was uh, came from an aristocratic class, aristocratic class, um, and received inheritance from family, began his career in medical school. I, I believe Darwin started like this as well. Um, left medical school because there's a few different reasons people would leave it because it bored them, because they wanted to make a name for themselves in some other field, or because they didn't like blood and guts. <laughs> Or, or just thought the field of medicine was too much to take. I can... Understandable. So they went on to pursue the natural world sciences like botany, zoology, astronomy, and in the case of the individuals talked about in this book, geology. Now there's a lot of detail about this split among geologists between the supporters of Werner's ideas, the Neptunists, who uh, defended the hypothesis that rocks and minerals were early liquid precipitates, and the Vulcanists, not, not, not the Star Trek Vulcans, the Vulcanists, those who believed uh, Hutton's idea to be closer to the truth. And this idea was, as Hutton described, uh, as a quote, the ruins of an older world are visible in the present structure of our planet, and the strata which now compose our continents have been once beneath the sea and were formed out of the waste of pre-existing continents. Uh, I, would, I would use remnants here rather than waste, but waste is what he wrote. The same forces are still destroyed by chemical decomposition or mechanical violence, even the hardest rocks and transporting the materials to the sea where they are spread out and form strata analogous to those of more ancient date. Although loosely deposited along the bottom of the ocean, they become afterwards altered. 
and consolidated by volcanic heat, and then heave up, heaved up, fractured, and contorted. What he was describing uh, with this uh, is a hypothesis we now understand to actually be the cyclical process of erosion, sediment deposition, and tectonic uplift, e even mountain building. Now, erosion and sediment depositions are not that difficult to observe over some period of time. You can see that uh, rivers will chip away at rock and soil along the banks and carry the material with them to the mouth of the river. Nutrients that go into the water supply make their way downstream, and they have to be uh, either eroded or uh, dumped in from somewhere. However, the later part, latter part of this hypothesis, the tectonic uplift, volcanoes and mountain building, wouldn't be fully understood until the theory of plate tectonics was formed. Um, and this would be about 200 years after Hutton's lifetime, and plate tectonics um, has been observed and confirmed. Very few people today will deny it for the reason that it explains too much too well of how the natural world works. But back at this time, the 17 and 18, early 1800s, each party of scientists, each convinced that the other was misguided, and turned into an almost different, two different religions like scission, schism, with each following models that alone were both incomplete, although Hutton's was far closer to the truth. Um, it just lacks the plate tectonics part. This, uh, th th this battle nearly destroyed the credibility of geology as an impartial science altogether. While geology today is a far more unified and unbiased field, certainly compared to back then, uh, we're actually witnessing the same thing happen in our time with climatology. There are these two viciously oppositional groups. Well, one being a lot nastier than the other, but uh, the, the, the nastier one is the one claiming that catastrophic and irreversible global warming is upon us, entirely human-caused, and should be the number one priority in environmental science to be addressed. And another group um, that, that that side calls deniers, but, but they're really um, more skeptical of the interpretations of the gathered data gathered data than pure deniers. The, there are some who think it's a, a hoax. I think I think the people who genuinely think a hundred percent is a hoax are rarer than people think, but a lot of data has been cherry picked. The, there is a third group, and this is the group I would say I'm in, that is certainly seeing warming happen, uh, some extent going on but is just exasperated, so tired, and extremely frustrated with the destruction of the credibility of clim climatology that has come from this. There are serious questions as to the agenda of the people pushing for stricter and stricter environmental protection laws, specifically those wanting more government encroachment upon people's lives. And I'll be talking about many of those questions and concerns in future videos. Actually, in a video, I'm, uh, the next video I will talk about with the uh, political atmosphere going on. So looking at it that way, looking at what happened to geology a couple hundred years ago and climatology now, can climatology, climatology and ecological science be rescued? Well, I don't know. I think it is important to look back at how geology was rescued, but there's a key difference in the situation. The credibility of geology was rescued when a new body and a new generation of scientists came along who were, like some of us, utterly exasperated with the overzealousness of both the Neptunists and the Vulcanists, and decided, and 
it must have been very difficult for them to do so at the time when the way scientists would make their name and their way in the field was through publishing books and theories. There's much more today about publishing articles and getting grants, but uh, there eventually came along geologists who devoted their field to observation and data gathering and uh, put off the publishing of any grand ideas until the data could be better understood. And eventually that did happen. Again, plate tectonics and later on the measuring the true age of the earth, which was not possible until powerful microscopes came along uh, to study the radioactive decay of elements within zircon crystals. Uh, if you want to see the story of this, there's a very good episode in Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, Cosmos series, which is a uh, direct follow-up sequel to Carl Sagan's Cosmos. Uh, the episode is titled The Clean Room, and that will go through the story of what happened. And you'll see why it's called Clean Room if you watch that episode. But by studying the radioactive decay in zircon crystals, is where we got the four and a half billion year old age of the Earth. That plus plate tectonics really pulled things together again for geology. To rescue climatology will take a similar thing happening. A new wave of new generation of scientists willing to do that in the field of climatology. Dedicate decades making observations and sifting through data until it is all unbiased. Is that possible? It did happen for geology. And there are, myself included, some who would like nothing more than for climatology to become unbiased again. But the problem is, now that it's so entangled in politics and the worst, international politics, that I don't have a definitive answer yet. People are going to have to stop trusting politicians and presidents like Emmanuel Macron, Barack Obama, Justin Trudeau, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, all who have talked about uh, climate change. When, when they say climate change, they really mean global warming. They should really just say what they mean. Um, talked about these as number one priority rather than actually defending their countries. Anyone who has a huge stake in the political world, particularly anyone who cannot give an independent meaning not handed to them by professors or speechwriters working for them or their party, explanation of how processes like the carbon, nitrogen, water cycle work, if they can't do even that, I mean, if they can't go through the basics if they're asked about how geological and climatological, ecological processes work, then their credibility, credibility needs to drop to absolute zero. Because someone talking about a science that complex needs to understand the basics. Um, certainly in order to uh, make any kind of policy how do you, I mean, how can we trust anyone to make policy if they don't understand how it works? So I think that's a good stopping point for this discussion. I know it was a long one. <coughs> that, <coughs> that was a long chapter, uh, three chapters actually. Again, put in breaks in the chapters. Um, the next one's a long one too, but it's only labeled as one chapter, uh, chapter five. I'm going to take uh, another break from Principles of Ecology for a time, but I will be making videos about uh, other topics for a bit. I'm really not happy about the political atmosphere of the world right now, but we will try and survive it.